Welcome to Question Time. Tonight we're in Newcastle. On tonight's panel, Matt Vickers, elected in 2019, one of the new crop of Conservative MPs in the northeast of England, recently appointed as a parliamentary aide at the Home Office. Thangham Debonair, Labour's shadow leader of the Commons and former shadow housing secretary. Alison Thewlis, Treasury spokesperson for the SNP at Westminster and an MP since 2015. Journalist, commentator and co-convener of the debate forum Battle of Ideas Festival, Ella Whelan. And managing director of the supermarket chain Iceland, environmental campaigner and author of The Green Grocer, Richard Walker. Good evening. Welcome to my panel. Welcome to the audience here in Newcastle. Great to see you. And of course, welcome to you at home as well. Do join in the conversation on social media in the usual way at BBC Question Time. And we'll see what you've got to say about tonight's topics. And to that end, let's have our first question from Steph Colwell. What picture does it paint to the general public now that two of Boris Johnson's ethics advisers have resigned? Matt, I'm going to start with you. What picture does well, it paint? Well, I think, I think that we, they both resigned for very different reasons, I think, by all accounts. I don't know the ins and outs of why that resignation occurred. We've seen the statement from Number 10 on it today. The suggestion it relates to uh, subsidies on steel. Actually, people in my part of the world will be very happy to hear that there's steel subsidies being put in there in efforts to protect uh, British jobs. But actually, we don't know, I don't know the ins and outs. And, you know, and what picture back, does it paint, do you think? That's the question Steph's asking. I think, do you know what? We can, we can make an assessment of what, why somebody's resigned when we know a bit more than I know uh, and probably a bit more than we all know at this point in time. I mean, he's talked about being put in an impossible and odious position and that the Prime Minister's behaviour was an affront. And we're going to go with the next question. The next question well, does never relate to well, how you push this just, thing into birthday cakes. And, uh, just, I'm just wondering, with, with descriptions like that, even if it's not entirely clear, the final thing that made him resign. When he uses words like that, what picture do you think it paints? I think it's very difficult to assess something from what we've seen of that discussion and what it was about. But you know what, if he's out there fighting for British jobs in the steel industry, I think people from our part of the world might be quite happy. Thank him. I think it's to, to lose one ethics advisor is careless, but to lose two smacks of something much more serious, and that's what's really worrying. It's really problematic when an ethics advisor who is clearly, from the tone of his letter to the Prime Minister, been gritting his teeth for the last few months and hanging on in there and he trying to, to stick with it contract. and tried to stick with it, when actually we get to the end of this week when he's had a very tough week, a grilling from a parliamentary committee, and tried really hard to stick with the job because he's clearly a man of principle. But his principles have led him to the belief that he was put, as Fiona said, in an odious and impossible position. That's what he said. Now, he also said that this was the last in several incidents. And I think when you've got a government who is prepared to put their own ethics advisor in such an impossible position, not once, not twice, but several times. That says all you need to know about the leadership at the top of this government. I'm afraid to say I cannot under... I really can't see how Boris Johnson is actually going to recruit another ethics advisor. But, oh, no, I realised on the train up what he's going to do. He's not going to. He is apparently going to redraw the, uh, the whole idea of that role, which is quite an extraordinary thing to do. A truly ethical and moral Prime Minister would have nothing to fear from a strong-minded, independent okay. ethics advisor. <laughs> Steph, you asked the question. What's your view? So, to, to be clear, the picture that appeals to me is that his behaviours and his words are not to be trusted and are not ethical. OK. <laughs> Woman here in the front. Matt, I was um, born and raised within your constituency. Um, I am from the People's Republic of Teesside um, <laughs> and went to Bishop Scarth School, um, that, you know, all, all from there. And my family continue to live um, in that area. Um, raised under Thatcher's government and everything that came with that. I do not think that there was one person who lives in your constituency that would be glad to see investment in steel over having a completely immoral Prime Minister who does not even know how to lie straight in bed, let alone um, be able to say that the lies he's saying will bring investment to them for their jobs. <laughs> woman here in the front, yes. I think that following on from Partygate, it does beg the question about Boris Johnson's integrity. All right, the man in the suit in the middle there. 
I would like to make a point that uh, Boris Johnson may have been broken the ministerial code. Um, and what I would like to ask is, does everybody understand what the ministerial code actually is? Because apparently he hasn't broken it, but then apparently he has. And I would just like to bring that in. OK. Well, the ministerial code outlines uh, a number of things. Uh, for example, that ministers uh, should declare self-interest, that they have to obey the law, uh, that they um, have to abide by the Nolan principles. I mean, I could go on at length, but there's a whole list of things that the ministerial code suggests. And what Lord Guite has said today is, or in the letter that we've seen, is the idea that a prime minister might to any degree be in the business of deliberately breaching his own code, i.e. the ministerial code is an affront. I can have no part in this, Richard. Maybe it will be third time lucky. I, d I don't know. Um, I mean, it is a bit embarrassing. It's far from ideal. Um, however, the reality is they had their vote and um, he, he got through it. Uh, and I think that the problem is we can't keep endlessly discussing it, you know, whichever side of the debate you're on. The, 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 the reality is, and hopefully we'll talk about it in more detail, we have a cost of living crisis. Uh, we need to get a grip on our, on our debt. But uh, nonetheless, your, Richard, your you're being asked a question by Steph. That's why you're here, mm. which is what picture does it paint to the public now two ethics advisers to Boris Johnson have resigned? So what's your answer to that? Yeah, I mean, look, you know, it's far from ideal. And... and uh, you know, we, we do need to try and move on and get through it. Um, and, and hopefully we can, we can focus on, on the important issues facing all of us. But, but it's, it's, it's But unfortunately, a bit Richard, if you have someone who is such a stranger to truth and such a complete enemy of ethical behaviour, having that person in charge of the cost of living crisis is in itself deeply worrying. Isn't this or a bit tricky for you, though, Thang? And because uh, it's, Lord Guy has not explained in detail why his, he, the, the, the final thing that has made him resign. We've heard from Boris Johnson that it concerns the extensions of tariffs on steel, which Labour have supported and called for tariffs to be extended again. So, we, so why are you so up in arms Because we this? don't know what aspect of the ministerial code Lord Guyte has been referring to. Now, it may okay. have been that the frame was about steel, but actually the ministerial code is about whether or not you're showing preferential interests to your friends or whether or not one of your ministers is. It covers that. We don't yet know whether that's okay. actually what's in there. Well, you know, I think it probably tells you a lot that you would take a stand not over a substantial issue like, you know, subsidies on steel or, you know, a greater question of production in the economy or, you know, big things, policies, what you're going to do with the cost of living crisis, holding the government to account for what they did throughout the pandemic. And instead, there's this reliance within Westminster, in the Westminster bubble of politicians, of trying to get at each other, both within the Tory party and, you know, it, through in the opposition, of trying to get at each other on these questions or you know, important questions of ethics and morality or behaviour. But I think, I don't know if people will agree with me, but I'm relatively bored of it by now. I mean, if you thought that Boris Johnson was a saint when he got voted in 2019, I think you need your head checked because, you know, his track record spoke otherwise. And that's not to make a virtue, by the way, out of a politician, you know, prime minister being somewhat, uh, you know, allegedly ethically dubious or, you know, you know being sort of liberal with the truth. But it's to say that I want this government, and in particular I want Boris Johnson, held to account over the policy decisions he's made or failed to make in relation to the, you know, what the fact that people are choosing between heating and eating at the moment, the fact that lots of people are not able to make their wages meet their needs in terms of their family life or their leisure time, or you know, questions about what he's done in relation to um, things like you know, the, the crisis in fuel, about green policies, about the lockdown policies about civil liberties, what this government's doing to free speech in this country with crackdowns and protests, Rwanda policy. I mean, the list goes on. Do something substantial, oppose in a substantial way. I'm just really sick and tired of this kind of slightly kind of infantile infighting within Westminster. It, ethics are important, but, I mean, it's been party gate. There's a no-confidence vote. When it, 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 just as a last point, it's also slightly depressing and disappointing that... Conservative MPs can't get it together to give a decent answer now. I mean, I know this news has only broke this morning, but Christ, I get briefed better than this in sort of small magazines that I work for. Come up, you know, figure out... It, it just shows a government that does not know where it's headed. You know, the, the quote about not being able to lie straight is a good one. But they're also not able to, you know, converse internally, talk about strategy, get, get a kind of position okay. together. And I think that tells you a lot. Matt, I will come back to you, but let's hear some more from our audience. A uh, young woman there in the middle, in a stripy shirt, yes. I think for an elective representative, a Prime Minister nonetheless, to have so blatantly broken the own rules that he set, 
is just an absolute disgrace and that should be a government that does not continue. Personally, I work for the National Health Service as a cleaner. My mum works as an ICU nurse. She's my inspiration. And all throughout COVID, she was holding up iPads while, m while people died in, in front of her and her colleagues, and they deal with that trauma every day. So for the Prime Minister to have been like, mm, well, we'll just have a party, I suppose. It doesn't really matter. I'm only leading one of the most influential countries in the entire world, the citizens that work really hard. I want to know why you supported Prime Minister Boris Johnson throughout this process, if you don't mind me, Mr Vickers. OK, I will come back to you. I need to get around the panel. Does anyone here want to speak? Because we've had a lot from the audience, uh, a lot of dismay, shall I put it? with what's happened today with the, with the Prime Minister. Anyone want to speak up for the Prime Minister? There's a lot, right, woman at the back, because I know there's a lot of Conservative voters here. Yes. I'd just like to say, could we remind ourselves, most people who voted for Boris voted for him because he is a maverick. He is different. He, he doesn't do things by the rule book or the book, whatever book it is. And if you did think he did before you voted for him, well, then you must believe in fairies. He got a job done. He's been given a difficult shift. Nobody predicted the pandemic, the way through it. There wasn't a book written about how to do it. Sorry, but I think he's done OK. All right. The man there at the back in the white shirt with the, with the blue jacket, yes. I think we're forgetting that also in the same week as this has happened, we have Keir Starmer being investigated for questionable ethics too, charging £2,500 an hour for legal advice or getting an advance on a book deal. I think... Yes, yeah, so I think that what, what the allegation is there is that he was late in declaring yes, the interest. but still not ethically right in our minds, possibly. What I would say is we're sick of beer gate, sick of party gate. We care what's happening in our own gates. Can people get on with governing our country and finally getting out of these problems we're in? Alison. Yeah, and I think lots of people would, would move on from that. Um, but I think the, the point that was made by the lady who's, whose mum's a nurse is that lots of people can't. Lots of people know exactly what they sacrificed. They know exactly what they gave up uh, during COVID. I've had constituents of mine getting in touch who, had, who were working in hospitals, had to, had to bar the doors as people banged in the door to say goodbye to their loved ones. Well, you had the Prime Minister partying up in Downing Street having parties to say goodbye to civil servants when people couldn't actually say goodbye to their loved ones. But nonetheless, that Lord Guite did not resign over that, and he did not resign over party. He's resigned over something else. He's not explained what it is. Uh, the Prime Minister has given his explanation as to what it is. Yes, and there's some suggestion that I, I saw mentioned uh, on the press earlier on that it's less about the steel industry, more about steel donations that um, Boris Johnson and his ministers have Of course, have had we, we don't know that at all. And we won't know, but, uh, but we will, I'm sure, in due course, find out, because all of these things come out in the wash eventually. But this scandal is just following the government around. It is bogged down in this scandal. It can't move on because people can't move on. And I think the only way for the Conservative Party to do anything about that is to get rid of Boris Johnson and they failed to do so last week. The man here in the front, a suit and tie. I think the thing with, the thing with party guys, it, Gate is it feels like he was in there kind of laughing at us working class people who were just going about, we weren't seeing family. I had my mum going to see my nana through a, through a window in a nursing home. And when she did get to go and see it all masked up and stuff, and he was in there partying up, partying up with friends, mixing, no social distancing. And I just think, to be honest, it's, it's a disgrace. Some things are inexcusable, and that is inexcusable. OK. The man here at the front. Hang on, we'll just get a microphone to you. Hang on. I had this go. conversation at work today, and, and basically I asked members of staff at work who didn't break COVID rules. And bar none, everybody broke COVID rules in one way, shape or another. The 20 minutes walk went to an hour. Nicola Sturgeon takes a mask off, caught twice on two occasions wear a mask off. Keir Starmer caught with his, the mask off. Everybody's broke the rules over a period of time, but it just seems to be dragging on and dragging on and dragging on around his party gate. Can it please just stop and let's move on to more? <laughs> Yeah, I think that's a really important point because, I th I, you know, Boris Johnson at this point is, I think, relatively indefensible, not just because he broke the rules, because it was that kind of sense of, you know, it, politicians decided that they could make up their own minds on what was a sensible level of risk or breaking rules or following rules, and the rest of us plebs couldn't. So we just had to have police chasing us across parks, telling us to go home and, you know, everything under the sun being illegal. But, the, you know, moving on from Partygate, which I really agree with you, I think we should do, the question is, which angers you more? Which are you more worried about returning in the future? 
you know, puking in number 10 and, you know, bad behaviour and, and rule breaking or whatever it is, or the policies themselves in which we saw, t particularly towards the latter end of the pandemic, when we were, ha you know, ha feeling the benefits of the vaccine and the emergency p period of the pandemic was over, still cracked down, still, you know, heinous treatment of people in care homes and inhumane treatment of people in care homes, school closures, all these kinds of things. Okay. This is what we should be criticising a government right. on, and by the way, an opposition party, not this kind of relatively okay. substanceless stuff of party uh, There's a hand up there in the middle. I can't quite see who it belongs to. Oh, yes, to you, yes. Yes. I think you've got your hand up, haven't you, with the pink hair? Yes. Oh, yeah. Brilliant. Let's hear from you. Um, can I just add that these things are going on and on and on because the opposition and any opposition party that we've got don't actually have any anything else to say. I'm, I mean, I'm really sorry. Let's just talk through. So, I mean, Ella says, why aren't we talking about some of those other things? We are. We have been banging on to the government about the cost of living crisis for months, with the result, with the result that after saying just Hang the day on, before, the pandemic just the day before, the just policies. the day before, you weren't an opposition. Just the, the day pandemic. before, the country wanted us to unite when we were in difficulty. But over the last three months, just the day before, they actually did a massive U-turn on the windfall tax and actually trying to help people out with their bills. So Boris why do Johnson you think that the woman there is, is uh, not hearing you? Well, I can. Under I'm not going to argue with the fact you haven't heard it. Obviously, that's your truth. I can get I that. But I just want to say. I watched Prime Minister's questions yesterday and the only thing I got out of it was that Keir Starmer was calling Boris Johnson Obi-Wan Kenobi. <laughs> That's all it was. And it was a joke that just went so long, it was unbelievable. So it, it bored us at the end. PNQs is, is a half-hour part of the week. It's a tiny part of what we do. We've been challenging the government on their running down of the health service, of their treatment of education, of their utter lamentable failure so on the policies then? So of levelling up. To get when of levelling up. Trouble. What's your other policies? And, well, bring, bring do you want me to give you a Labour Party table? manifesto? Because I can. I can give you a Labour no. Party it, party with the broadcast if Fiona wants us to. I definitely I don't want oh, that. On. But simply, I think you've, you've yeah. addressed your point. As far as you're concerned, you've got policies, but you're not hearing them. I want to bring you back in, because obviously there has been support for the for the Prime Minister, there's been criticism of the Prime Minister too, and of you for supporting him. Yep, I don't think anybody can box off the hurt that was felt by people during the pandemic. I didn't get into politics to do the pandemic and actually we talked about, about the Labour Party backing us during the pandemic on all the measures. They didn't, they didn't turn up. There was a crowd of us who, who had the debate with our own government true. about what was happening while they were abstaining. But moving on to that, there was two questions out there. One was about what impression does this cast to the public? Well, the impression that's cast to the public is whatever is on the front line, front page of the newspaper every week, isn't it? That's part of the problem. We're, we're covering a story now that nobody knows any details about, and we're assuming things and casting aspersions. Actually, we don't well, know the details. Hang on why. just a minute. Well, hang media. on just a minute. <laughs> the, the reason we're covering it is because the, the Prime Minister's ethics advisor wrote a letter in strong terms, I think that is fair to say, when he describes it as, he put, as being put in an impossible and odious position, uh, the Prime Minister breaches his own code in the front, he wants no part in this. Do you think it shouldn't be reported? People are sat here having to guess what, what's gone on, but actually there was a big question out there about why I supported the Prime Minister. And also, there's um, an, this audience here, we get the questions about half an hour before everyone tells us, there were lots of questions about this. Right, well, well, I'm going to answer the other question that came out from the lady in the centre there who asked me why I supported the Prime Minister. Minister. And we all know the heartache that went on during the pandemic. It was awful. It was god-awful. Two years of everybody's life. Uh, there was youngsters who were, you know, put through terrible situations at school. There was people who really suffered, people on the front line of the NHS who had to give their lives for two years to this cause. Um, I lost someone during the pandemic. I understand that hurt. But at the same time, I also didn't get elected to spend all of my time talking about birthday cake. Um, and why I backed the Prime Minister... Well, you would have us talk about it every week at the MPs. And actually... The reason I backed the Prime Minister is because when I entered politics and was elected in 2019, this country had been tearing itself apart over Brexit for years. Uh, he got it done. He moved us on. We then went into a pandemic, one of the toughest cards we could possibly be dealt. We, we, we could still be wearing masks now if it were not for the most effective vaccine rollout. The fastest the vaccine. Not once, came up here. not twice, the three times. Developed. Three times. We were lost from that pandemic. And the thanks scientists. to the support that the government gave during that pandemic, when it started, we thought there was going to be mass unemployment. We thought this country would be, with the dogs, absolutely battered and we'd be in mass unemployment. Actually, employment's in a really good place. The economy is in a really good place because of the measures that were put in place. What? And that's why... Like you're in a good place? Moreover... Hang on, hang on, hang on. When you say the economy's in a really good place... Well, 
OK, you're doing a there whole long list. But when you say the economy is a really good place, there is a small issue. There is the jobs going to left, right and centre. We have the fastest well, growing economy in 2007 last year. People can't pay their bills. Yeah. That's, I'm sure people can't come and that's, of course, that's not the government's fault, but you want to take credit for other things, which aren't the government's responsibility um, either. The scientists came up with the vaccine. People here, people across the country can't pay their bills. That's the long and the short of it. We're going to come back to the cost That's the long and the short of it. But on my answer to why I back the Prime Minister, as a Stocktonian, uh, I can tell you about what's come to Stockton. We've, we're doing very well. Jobs from the Treasury in London, up in Darlington, fantastic high-end jobs, opportunities for young people in our area. The UK's first and largest free port, creating 18,000 so jobs singing, on our doorstep. In the streets, Great basically. jobs. Are they really? So everyone's uh, very grateful okay. for that. That's nice got, I, I can go on. We've got a big list. Peace and love has broken out here on the panel, as you can see, <laughs> and we've only been going about 20 minutes. I'm going to take another question, but before I do, just let me tell you where we're going to be next week, which is Stratford-upon-Avon, and the following week we'll be in Inverness. That's on the 30th of June. So if you'd like to come and be part of the audience, go to the Question Time website and you can follow the instructions there and come and be part of the programme. OK, let's take another question now. From Denise, Denise Cresham. Is the government's commitment to relocate illegal immigrants to Rwanda going to address the problem of people trafficking? Alison. No, it's not. It's going to cost an absolute fortune and it's not going to help in any way whatsoever. Um, it really is quite abhorrent to take people who have come from war zones from all around the world, who perhaps have come here because they have family here. They want to reunite with the only people perhaps that they know that are still alive. Uh, and the government instead wants to put them on a plane and ship them to Rwanda and they will never get to come back. And I think that is just the most abhorrent thing to do to vulnerable people, um, the most desperate people in the world. Uh, and I cannot believe uh, that the government would go ahead with such an awful plan. And it won't fix the problem either, because most of the people that are coming over in those, those small boats, they're coming over because the only way you can claim asylum in this country is by getting here. You can't claim it from some other country except for very limited circumstances, uh, such as the very limited number of people that have allowed through the Afghanistan re uh, scheme and the small numbers of people that have so far made it uh, through the Ukraine scheme. So you have to get here to claim asylum in the first place. And there is no other mechanism to do that. And the government knows that and does nothing about that. Uh, and they have no interest in doing so, and so it seems. Richard. Um, look, look, you know, this, this is um, a, a horrific issue. It needs to be dealt with a, a, a lot of humanity. Um, I think m perhaps my, my kind of liberal gut instinct um, was that we shouldn't offshore our problems. But when you take a step back, the businessman in me um, knows that we've got to break the business uh, model of the people traffickers who are trading on human misery and, and suffering. Um, and, and actually, um, what is inhumane, what is... Uh, shameless is uh, uh, what's happening today and yesterday and will happen tomorrow which is allowing uh, uh, people to cross the channel overladen uh, with women and children in unsafe boats uh, risking that crossing um, I don't have any uh, alternative solutions be interested to know if anyone else on the panel does but in the absence of other solutions I think this is obviously controversial it's obviously a bold um, uh, idea but if it can happen in the numbers that the government are saying uh, then actually that would break the business model and it would stop uh, uh, something that has been happening for far too long and we need to get a grip of it okay. the man at the back there. Hi, most of these people crossing the channel are young men looking for work, and all I'm going to say is, when all these four-star hotels are full up, when the immigration centres are full up, where do we put these people? Where do we put these people? Because we're going through a crisis ourselves, and it seems to me the money spent on this problem is more money spent on them than it is on our own kind, and we, we can't keep on letting these people like this, this, the woman on the panel says, the only reason how they can get in it is coming across. That's inviting these people to come into this, this country. What we're going to do when it's all full and there's no room left? Yes, they are. Yes, they are. And a safe, a safe place, a safe place. In, yeah, and they're running away from France. They're running away from Spain. And they're coming over and risking their lives. Let's just it let's just hang on a minute. We'll just get the microphone to you. So, do we put them up in the four four star hotels? Do we? We don't. Sorry, what are you trying to say? We couldn't hear you. 
They're human beings, and yes. we're forgetting that we're they're humans. Yes, we are. Escaping so what, dreadful, so what dreadful conditions. What, 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 because they like our conditions. Because they're... It's an but easy that's touch. That we are an easy the touch. That's why there was 400 yesterday. That's not working. OK. Let's hear from the man in the front here in the striped shirt. What's the gentleman on the end said about um, women and children come across? I very rarely see that. It's middle-aged men under 40. Now, they're coming mainly when they're crossing from Calais. They're coming from a country that's not at war. They're coming through. They've come through seven or eight different countries to get here to come across. And my question to the SNP person is, these people, that was 600 in the last two days, are you going to take them in? Where are you going to put them? I'm a humanitarian. I believe that people from Ukraine who are fleeing should come here, but people, just a second, people that have come across through seven or eight different countries to get here, and then they're coming across, risking their lives. Yes, I know about all the people that are paying, they have to pay 10,000 and all that, but they're risking their lives to come across a very busy channel, right? They're here now. Where are you going to put them? So, in my constituency in Glasgow Central, <laughs> we've got the highest immigration caseload in Scotland. We have, we have been the um, resettlement, uh, main resettlement place in Scotland for people. But every single Scottish local authority, every single one of them took people as part of the Syrian scheme because that was a good scheme, it was a funded scheme. What happens in the Home Office just now, the reason that people are being put in hotels is because the Home Office is underinvested in its staff. They can't process the claims that people are making and they are stuck waiting in limbo for ages. If that wasn't the case, people could work, people could get on with their lives. Instead, they're being kept up in these hotels rather than being allowed to move on with their lives to contribute to the economy. They could be rapists, murderers, everything. They're coming. You don't know who they are. They could be and neither coming do you. next year. <laughs> well, but check who they are. Check. They don't even have documents. I'll just, I'll just, I'll just put one in. fact in here, which is that 71% of applications, this is according to the Refugee Council, were granted asylum or protection at the initial decision stage. That's but where are the 600 that come in the last two days going to be housed? OK, no, we, we hear what you have to say. The, the woman there in the glasses. Um, I'd just like to ask people who, you know, have expressed views of, you know, where we're going to put them and why should we have them about how desperate, think about the most desperate situation that you could think of in this country and how desperate would you have to be to leave this country and to, to flee and to go across Europe or wherever else. So I think we should bear in mind these people are human beings who are fleeing desperate situations, whatever they might be. OK. Bang him. So, will it work, was the question, I think, originally? Well, no. Because, first of all, it's you be fundamentally... Sure well, it's already not working. We've heard from several people... It's, who said only, just it's only just starting. But started. the threat of it has been known about for some time. And we were told, when this plan was announced, that the mere threat of it would be enough to shut down the business model of the traffickers. It's not shutting down the business model of the traffickers because the traffickers have nothing to lose by continuing to take money, whatever happens to the refugees at the other end. So it's not actually tackling the problem the government said they wanted to crack down on. Now, what they could do, if they wanted to crack down on people traffickers, which I don't see any evidence of is not cut the National Crime Agency. They could set up assessment centres closer to centres of conflict so that assessments could be done rather than people making any crossings across Europe or as far as Calais. But fundamentally, I think this is an un-British thing to do because it's ruining lives and it's dumping people on another country, on a developing country. So to the point, thing, the point that you're vast hearing from the audience, and this is a great thing because we actually mm -hmm. have people here making their yep. point, who are saying, well, where will we house these people? Where will we put them up? How will we find the money if to we do that? What's your answer them? to that? Well, we're spending a fortune, by the way, send, not sending them to Rwanda at the moment. It is costing hundreds and hundreds of thousands of we pounds. Okay, but that's not, not to. Pounds, okay. on but that's not answering their question. Because what we're spending on hotels at the moment is because the Home Office is a, is a government department in meltdown. I have people in my constituency who have applied for asylum. They may not be entitled to it, but they're sitting waiting for a decision 
which is at our own cost because we don't allow them to work. Now, if the Home Office would only get its act together and actually make decisions quicker and fairer, we'd be able to get rid of people who are not entitled to be here and those who are entitled to be here would be able to get on with their lives and contribute and pay taxes and not be in hotels. But okay. that's not what the question was about. The question was about the Rwanda plan. It's expensive, it's unworkable and it's fundamentally un-British. OK, the woman there in the glasses, yes, with the blonde hair. I would like to know why the, the government isn't tackling the French authorities who are allowing these people yeah. to leave from the then beaches and cross, but why aren't they? I don't know. OK, we'll, get to, we'll, we'll ask Matt in a minute. And the man there in the suit with the white shirt and the glasses. Um, so, I, I'm a member of the Tory party, but I actually agree with Thangham on this, because... Not... Now, that's interesting. So, what's going so, on there? So, regardless of what you think about the policy itself, it's absolutely incompetent uh, incompetence in the Home Office. Um, Matt, you're a PPS, I think, in the Home Office. Um, what on earth is going on? Um, regardless of the policy, this just strikes of incompetence, which is um, through and through in this government, in, in every single department. Does this, does this make you question your support for the Conservative Party? The only reason I'm a member of the party now is to get rid of Boris Johnson. Um, I, think, I think one of my one of my concerns about this entire debate is that when you take it down to its rawest form, so we, we, it's the heat, most heated discussion we just had, and the problem is that people think one side thinks the other side is racist, one thinks is is morally superior. Actually, we have a problem. Uh, no one here has criminal... accused anyone of racism. No, but that's that I'm aware where the, that's where it gets to. That's where yeah. some of this debate gets to. It gets very heated and it goes. We have a problem. There is illegal groups, cri criminal groups, putting people on boats who are then risking their them. lives coming to the UK. That is not part of a modern, you know, uh, modern immigration system that we can, you know, praise. We need to solve that problem. It has to be solved. We've been working with the French authorities. We've thrown yeah. a lot of money at the problem. We've put a lot of resource into it in France. It doesn't work. We've found a solution. It's not a solution. You You're haven't got a solution either. Just that, gave you okay, wait, let's let, let's yeah, let Matt answer, because he hasn't got what a word. Well, actually, you know what? We've made it an offence for these people, these traffickers, or these smugglers who bring people across. We made it an offence. The Labour Party wouldn't support that as a thing. They didn't support us giving life sentences to these horrible people smugglers who put people's lives on the line. We need to generate a response. <coughs> this is a response. It's an, eff an effort to deter people from getting in that boat and coming across. And you know what? If we had that, if we had control of what was coming across, then maybe we'd be able to open more safe and legal routes. This country has a very proud history of helping people out That's when they're in need. Right? 200,000 since 2015 from Syria, from Afghanistan. It's, you know, this okay. And what about, what about your fellow Conservative there, who says, what are you doing? The Home Office is in a mess. You're only in the Conservative Party to get rid of Boris Johnson, I think. Yeah, said, uh, no. absolutely. I, I was hoping Matt would have some courage and vote against Boris Johnson in the recent... Um, recent uh, uh, confidence vote. Confidence vote. But, uh, but clearly he's, he's been made a PPS and, and everything like that, so maybe not. Would you not. like to answer your... I think, you know what, there's, we've, we've actually had... When we talk about this, this party gate and Boris and all that sort of thing, and we put it in the box... Well, we're actually, this is talking about Home Office policy here. But, well, yeah. well, 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 we can either talk about Boris and how you might want to be a party member to get rid of him. OK, uh, no, fair enough. Yeah. The reality is that actually we've had the police investigation, we've had the Sue Gray investigation, we've got the privileges investigation. A lot of people now want to start talking about the real issues of the day and they want to talk about what's been delivered but it, for it them. Is, and it really is just a matter of time. If it wasn't this, what is it going to be? And it, it's just an embarrassment, frankly. The Home Office is... Let's bring you on. Let's bring you on the question, which is, is the government's commitment to relocate illegal immigrants to Rwanda going to address the problem of people trafficking? Uh, no, I don't think it is. I think that the, you know, I w was amused by um, Justin Welby making the headlines um, for criticising the government, saying, you know, a, a statement that I actually agreed with, that we were subcontracting out our responsibilities. Um, and the important thing to know about the Rwanda policy is that it is not original. Um, by the Conservative government. One of the reasons why I was such a passionate voter for Brexit was because I was appalled by the European Union's immigration policy. Um, you know, in 2004, made a deal with Libya uh, to basically keep, migrate, keep migrants from crossing over billions of pounds. Obviously the UK went, was part of it. At, and, and Gaddafi um, threatened to turn Europe black, and so the European Union bunged them five million um, in order for that not to happen. Similar deals were made with Turkey. 
um, with Erdogan in order to keep Syrian refugees from crossing over into Greece and Bulgaria. So the point, um, you know, and Frontex have now, the EU border agency, took up the, um, that sort of work of making sure that, you know, talk about inhumane, pushing people back in the sea and things like that. So the point I'm making is that when, when politicians, you know, who are not part of the Conservative Party, opine about the inhumanity of this, which, by the way, I tend to ag agree with, by and large, I want more, a li more liberal approach to immigration policy, not a less one. Um, it, you, you sort of, you know, the double standards thing comes back up and you wonder why weren't you talking about subcontracting our responsibilities when it was the European Union doing it. But I also think that this question of, it's, you know, it's an important question of where are the resources going to come. And, you know, both the Conservative Party and the Labour Party in their manifestos in 2019 recognised people's desires to control borders in relation to the Brexit vote. And it now seems like talking about controlling borders is impossible. Um, but, the, but I wouldn't let the government off the hook that easy because, you know, the question of resources, whether it's housing or GP appointments or school places or anything like that, is, is a, the question is, why aren't you building houses? Why aren't you hiring more GPs? Why aren't you building more schools? Not that this issue is going to be the, the crisis of resources in this country is going to be resolved by keeping 600 people away or putting them on a plane. So a better immigration policy, please, a commitment to, you know, controlling borders but I think the people like me who want to have a more liberal immigration system need to start making okay. the argument on a political basis rather than relying on these you know, slight double standards of sort of okay. un-Britishness and inhumanity. Let's take another question from Anna. Anna Carr. Is that how I pronounce your surname? It's Kerr, it? but Kerr. don't worry Anna about Kerr. it. <laughs> so my question is, the cost of living crisis is significantly exacerbating regional inequalities. Recent GDP shows a 2.3% growth in London, but a 1.2% decline in the North East. Leveling up is failing. How would Labour fix this? Right, so you're directing your question to Labour. So, Thangam, you're here. How would you address this? Right, well, first of all, um, this is a cost of living crisis. You're absolutely right, it is exacerbating regional inequalities. And you say exacerbating, that's because they already existed. And that's because there are parts of the country that over the last 12 years in particular, the Conservatives have ignored and failed to care about. Now, they're in trouble now because now they're representing some of these seats. They actually have to start to say, oh, we're going to do something for you. Now, I'm afraid to say that the government's levelling up flagship policy as it was in 2019. It's already been shown up to be smoke and mirrors. OK, because the question is very policy, deliberately, how would Labour and, fix and this? And I'm so... just about to tell you. Well, let, do, so, do, do if get we on could, with that. If, we, if, if, we, if Labour was in government, what the Tories could be doing instead and what Labour would do instead is, first of all, we would have an emergency budget... We would start right now because we are in an emergency. We would make sure that our tax policy worked for small businesses which have suffered from years of terrible systems of business rates. So they're making people redundant or unable to trade and that's where lots of people work. We would make sure as well that we had a tax policy that was fair and so Rachel Rees, who's our Shadow Chancellor, is reviewing every aspect of tax policy. But we would also make sure that there was investment in the renewable industry which is going to be one of the great growth sectors of the future so that those good skilled, well-paid jobs would be coming to the North East, to South Wales, to parts of Scotland that have uh, suffered as well from being left behind, to the South West, which, which I'm part of representing, where we have also great regional and in-region inequality. Investing in those jobs that also help us with our climate crisis, as well as with our jobs crisis, which we've got at the moment, in that the, Matt will probably tell you in a moment we've got record levels of employment, but we all know that we've got gaps in, in how we're running the country, because there are places where people can't get the jobs that they really want because they haven't got the right skills or they haven't had the right training. And then there are other parts of the supply chain that aren't working because they can't get the employees. Something badly wrong with how the economy is growing. Anna, does that answer your Rather question? Rather failing to grow, I might say. Anna, let me just come back to you quickly before I move around the rest of the audience. Does that answer your question? Yes, it did. Thank you very, very much for that response. And I would now like to direct that response to the Conservative oh, representative. Oh, I'm going to sit right <laughs> <there. laughs> yeah, <it's> Marvellous. <laughs> marvellous. <laughs> but so, Anna, you can't catch a break. Don't do me out of quite yet. No. Hang on. Let me get around the rest of the audience, because they've also got <laughs> something to say, and I want to hear that just as much. Just the man in front in the red and white top. I think you're very well versed on what you're saying. Keir Starmer must have trained you well, because he rambles on like rambling said rumble, but we never get a result. You sorry, you he rambles on like what? <laughs> rambling said rumble. <laughs> yeah. okay, that's a new he one really on is the last straw, <laughs> the last leader of the Labour Party. Didn't do you any favours. 
I thought this man was going to be better. Unfortunately, he just rambles on telling stories and no, there's no result, there's no solution. When you talk about we're going to get these people back, send them to Rwanda, what is his idea? What can we do with these people? Nobody yeah, wants to yeah. really write it off. But what you're saying there, it's just going on the way he does. To be quite honest, you don't solve anything. You don't give an alternative. I, I just and you're did. exactly like Keir Starmer. Just That's the problem with this. Hang on, hang on. Hang on. Let, 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 let me let Pangham have a quick response I was before asked, I move on. I was asked what, we should, what Labour would do instead to solve the cost of living crisis, and I gave one detailed example. I can give plenty of others. I also... I've, I know Keir to be a fundamentally decent man who's hard-working, who's very bright, and all of the policies that I've already talked about this evening, about investment in renewables, about cracking down on the cost of living crisis, about reforming our tax policy, about making sure that the business rates that small businesses are currently crippled by are fair, and, and I'm getting nods from my left here, <laughs> also some for reforming the way that business rates work so that those online industries, which benefit from, from tax breaks, frankly, which they shouldn't be benefiting from and are hurting our small high street businesses there's any number of things which I've just I've just listed you six okay. I also listed three things that we could do that the government could do about solving the Rwanda the the plan to send people to Rwanda which is fundamentally unworkable so I have actually answered with several policies Richard let's hear from you because uh, we're here in Newcastle and the North East is, is, is a, an important area for you in terms of Iceland What's yes heartland <laughs> definitely um, and um, we have a thousand stores around the UK and we uh, you know I travel around it every week and and um, some, some of our customers might only have 25 quid a week to spend on food. And they were struggling before the cost of living crisis. Um, it keeps me up at night in terms of how some of our customers are, are going to cope going forward. So this is a real issue. And you're right, uh, regionally, um, it, it's more unequal, of, of course, particularly in the UK. Um, for me, levelling up is not about big grandiose infrastructure projects like HS2. It's about the politics of the everyday, the ordinary, the cancelled bus routes. The Yes, it's about jobs and investment and connectivity, but it's about um, civic pride and uh, a sense of ownership in the place that you're from. And I see this uh, in, in, in the stores that I visit, that that um, lack of, of, of pride, civic pride, is declining. Um, so it's about people feeling proud of where they're from uh, as well. Um, and what do you think should be done? I think um, certainly businesses can, can do more. Um, we work day and night to try and keep food as affordable as possible, but as you all know, it's going up. Um, but we're, we're trying a lot, you know, freezing one pound lines. We're launching three products for 3P this weekend. 15% um, off for our staff, 10% for over 60s, loads of stuff. But we can do more and, and we will, and we will not uh, rest in, until uh, this cost of living crisis is over. In terms of the government, well, actually, um, I, do, I do actually agree with Thangham that um, if, we, if we look at our high streets, the, it should alarm us all. And this isn't just self-interest arguing for business rate reform. Um, uh, retail is the larg largest private sector employer, um, but also it's about the sense of place, community. They're the fabric of our societies. And I say this as one of the biggest online retailers in the UK. I think we need root and branch reform, which the government have said that they'll look at. So let's speed it up. Let's get to it. Let's start charging online sales tax and, and take away this historic taxation from bricks and mortar retailers, which is crippling our high streets and therefore okay. um, uh, affecting our communities. Man there with the pink shirt. The Labour Party talk a good story, but they've got no real alternatives. They haven't been in power for over 13 years. And when you come to the next general election, you still be in opposition because you've got no solutions whatsoever. OK, I think... Come on. Feels, no, I'm going to come to you in a minute. I need to get around the audience as well. Yes, the man at the back there with the glasses and the blue shirt. Yes. I'd just like to say that the lad at the front there where he said he's joined the Conservative Party to get rid of Boris Johnson. I, I was in the Royal Navy for over three years and never once joined a ship to try and get rid of the captain. I think there should be... <laughs> Um, I think that, you know, in terms of the cost of living crisis, yes, Rishi Sunak has recently given out, um, you know, a significant amount of money. They talk about emergency budgets. We hear, you know, there's this a lot is of specifically about levelling up. Okay, yeah, but um, the context is we've had a lot of crowing about, you know, the success of windfall taxes and all that kind of thing. But levelling up was supposed to, it was supposed to 
mean something substantial in relation to not just sticking plasters about um, to fix the economy, but at fundamental things like investment in infrastructure, investment in R&D, investment in you know, jobs, building houses, putting bricks to the ground, you know, like things you can hold in your hand. And it's quite clear that the government, you know, from yes, they use the pandemic as an excuse, and yes, they use the uh, the war in Ukraine as an excuse, and it's always something going on that means that their hands are tied. Um, but it's quite clear that that levelling up agenda has amounted to very little in terms of uh, changes for people's lives in the northeast or in other parts of the country. Changes in wages. Talk about you know the high level of jobs in this country. I mean, everybody knows that the quality of the jobs. Uh, is the thing that's in question. You know, there's have been a lack of secure jobs, you know, the people on zero hours contracts. All this thing doesn't amount to a wonderful, rosy, fantastic economy. But then you have to ask, I mean, the question was about the Labour Party, and you have to ask what an opposition can offer to, um, to solve this. And the, the policies that the Labour Party have, particularly in relation to something like house building, are really not hugely different from a Conservative government. And this is a Conservative government that can't even meet its own targets. And on the key, you have across the country now, coming up next week, and maybe people will be divided on this, working people, labouring people, working class people, going out on strike because they're deciding that there is nothing else that they can do and they have to show their employers and indeed their government that something has got to give here. And will the Labour Party support that? No. So okay. what can you do? The woman there uh, in the floral top, yes. Hello, yeah, I'd just like to say I'm a volunteer at one of the busiest food banks in, in the country, Newcastle West End Food Bank. And in recent months, just as a volunteer, I only do one shift a week, but I've seen more and more people in full-time employment, sometimes they're in nurses' uniform, yeah. coming to collect food parcels. And something is dreadfully wrong when people's full-time wages can't isn't sufficient for them to be able to afford to, to live well, to, to affordably feed their families. Um, I just think it's, it's shocking. It's, it's something fundamentally needs to be done about it. So when people come along <laughs> who, who are in full-time employment, you say they're wearing a nurse's yeah, uniform yeah, and things, yeah. what are they saying to you? They're, they're actually embarrassed. They're ashamed to be using a food bank. It's often the first, first time users have never had to do this before. Um, and it's like, you know, it, but we always say, you know, we, we don't judge needs most. Take the food that we can give you and take, use that, that income you've saved on heating your home, paying your bills, keeping yourself out of debt, whatever, whatever it takes, really. So, um, yeah, but, you know, there's a full spectrum of people who access our services and we, we provide debt advice as well. Um, and it's just it, the numbers are going up. I've seen even in the time I've been there, um, I do a, chef, a shift on a Wednesday morning. We were averaging about 75 households in a four hour window period. And it's now up to over 100. Right. And that's in a few short months. So, so Matt, as Anna wanted to direct the question to you as well, the cost of living crisis is significantly exacerbating regional inequalities. Recent GDP shows a 2.3% growth in London, but a 1.2% decline in the North East. Levelling up is failing. So, Labour's been asked how they'd fix it. How, so, how I've, been, I've sat it? here very well behaved and very quiet. But well, I, that's because everyone has a turn, questions. that, in fairness, yes, okay, and okay. now it's yours. So, first thing about business rates. You know what Labour's plan is on business rates? They're going to replace them with a commercial property tax. Smells like business rates to me. Uh, but actually, on business rates, if you are a small business, £110,000 rateable value, your rates this year have been cut by 50%. It's progress. It's a lot more progress than we've had for several rates? decades. Um, uh, do you agree with that, on... Richard? You... Sorry. Were you listening? Do you yeah. agree with that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, business, business rates are a hugely disproportionate cost for us, and, and they are increasing year on year on year. Okay. More so, progress yeah. this year than ever before. 50%. Yeah, but for smaller businesses, and, and actually that will help the corner shops and, and the small businesses, and that's great, but actually where the vast bulk of the employment is, it doesn't help us, um, and that's why we need... Actually, whilst I'm at it, how about... Okay. Um, Hang on, uh, I need him to answer the question. A, a, a price well. cap on energy for business as well. The question is about... It's expensive, it was since commercial we, property Since tax. we have a business person here, I thought I'd ask him. But the question is, or the point Anna's making is levelling up is failing. So, you are all very welcome to come down to Teesside, where I will show you levelling up in action. Uh, we've already talked about the fact that we've got treasury jobs. Amazing job. When I was at school, so I grew up in Stockton, uh, labour control, by and large, on the council, places like Redcar that have been labour, Darlington, labour for a very long time. Uh, and they changed their mind this time, and they changed their mind because they didn't think that Labour was delivering for them locally. Lots of other issues. But actually, for me, and what I've seen since I got elected, has been huge. There's a, p there's a pinch point on the A19 that causes masses of traffic every day, and it's an economic hamper to our part of the world. Hundred and some million pounds being invested in that. 
new train station on its way. We'd given up on our airport in Teesside. The Tories have fixed it. We're actually investing because levelling up, it's, not, it's about hooking up the, the parts of our economy that can do more. Whether that be that free port, the UK's biggest and first free port in Teesside, 18,000 jobs. These are good jobs, good engineering jobs in that green renewable sector. Um, I've got a town deal in Thornaby, a town with a lot of pride. Uh, that is now looking at its town centre, getting rid of skanky, horrible buildings that have been sat there empty for years. Uh, we're installing a new uh, training hub, which will let youngsters get great engineering jobs. Come, you can come to Teesside and I will, will personally invite you all to come and look at my new train station, my new training hub for young people who are going to get great jobs. And you can have a look at what we're doing in the high street. OK, we, no, about... we hear you. We hear... I just see that the, the woman here has put her hand up. So you live in Stockton. Um, I don't live in Stockton anymore, but I was born and raised in Come Stockton, back, right. and my mum um, still back. lives so, there. But Boots on Stockton High Street is just closed yeah. down, I think, one of the widest high streets in the country, and you cannot get people other than a charity shop to open um, on the high no street. Yeah. I'll um, tell you what... Well, hang on, just let, let you know. Um, from from what I, from what I recall, when I go and see my mother, <laughs> that um, that you've got you had investment on Wellington Square, which is at the top of the high street. Um, there, you can't get people to you know even your big businesses like Debenhams closed at, at the top there. One of the things that you probably have got that's been rec and recently quite good is the Globe has opened, and um, which has been I think Stockton Council put a huge amount of investment in that, which I believe is Labour um, controlled and not Conservative, if I remember okay, rightly. So, yeah, more mixed picture there. But let me come to Alison. So I'm sorry, I just need to bring Alison because she's okay. managed to get a word in edgeway so far. Yeah, I mean, the, the Conservatives' approach to levelling up is let's build a great big shiny thing so we can cut a ribbon on it, rather than the fundamental change that you need to actually make a difference in local economies. You need to look at the housing, you need to look at the infrastructure, you need to look at the, the train links, for example. So we've got the Elizabeth Line opening in London, yet another big shiny rail line for London, and the north of England goes without. That's not going to make the fundamental changes that you need um, to make sure that people can live here, work here, invest here, that they don't have to travel away to London to go and start their careers or do their education, that you can make a success of yourself right here in your local community. Uh, and that's what's missing from the government's plan. It's no strategy, no joined up means of looking at all of this together. Um, it's a big shiny thing and nothing really of any great substance underneath it. And without that, you're not going to make the real change that needs to happen. OK. Woman here in the front, and uh, almost at the front. Well, actually, the woman in the front, sorry, in the stripy shirt, they're not come to you behind, yes. I'm not actually a Conservative supporter by no means, but I actually live in Blythe Valley. And the one thing I would say, I've seen some levelling up there because I've just introduced a disused railway line linking Ashington, the former mining community, running through Blythe to Newcastle. So I would applaud them for that. Not a lot of other things, but I will say that they have started where I live, putting their plans into action. OK, and the woman behind you. Um, I just wondered, Matt, what, what you thought about what the woman behind me was talking about in terms of the food bank uh, in Newcastle. I know that you just passed over that really quickly when the question no. came to you. I just would like you to address her point. By all means. Yeah, can I, can I, can I... Do the roundup though. We got a Stockton uh, question back at me. Uh, briefly. So on Stockton but, but, High Street, but, but that as well, please. On Stockton High Street, the 16.5 million coming there. Hopefully, you can persuade your mum to sign a petition that's going to bring a new community diagnostic hospital to Stockton, which I'm campaigning for at the moment. Huge investment in Stockton. Uh, the Labour Council was had a role in putting Wellington Square together, etc. But 16.5 million of government money. Uh, okay. New diagnostic it's hub. Government's okay. money. It's actually the tax. Hang on. It is taxpayers. Would you like to yeah. answer but it's coming the woman north. There. It's coming north. Would you like to answer the woman there as well, please? Yeah, around food bank usage. Do you know the what? increase in food bank usage. Yeah, the cost of living crisis is is a nightmare. I speak to people every week it's about what's happened crisis. to the. It, it's not a UK phenomenon that that prices on on oil here. and gas and electric are going up and are going through the roof in a way we would never ever have wanted to see what's them. Here? It is painful in every day. I speak to people who are suffering that. One of the big things, though, is that money is, is your money. So the government does not have government money in a blank checkbook. What we, we give to support people, we've got to take from somebody else or take at some point in the future. So there is, there is a balancing act there. There is support going in for the most vulnerable in the best way that we can. But we, we've got to manage that, haven't we? Some of the most vulnerable families will get £1,600 extra via rebates, via winter fuel allowance, to try and help. But you know what? It's, it's very tough out there, and the best we can do is support those who are most in need.
Okay, let me... Can I just say, was there not a food plan um, announced on Monday? And did the government not take on its own advisers chief mm -hmm. recommendations, one of which was to increase the number of children who could access free school yeah. meals by something like about a million and a half mm -hmm. um, children, and if, if not more? And they've just decided not to do that at all. Okay. So, Richard, you wanted to come back. Yeah, just back to the lady's comment on uh, boots closing down. We might, we might look at that because we're opening 30 sh shops a year. However, all we want other to do... All, other shops are available. <laughs> all we want to do is open shops, uh, create jobs and pay tax. Um, and, and yet every single one of our 30 shops is delayed in terms of the new store openings because we have this sclerotic planning system. And I think a, a really good uh, suggestion for Labour, Conservatives or anyone else is just to resource up our local planning departments um, because they're overwhelmed with applications and that's why we have such a delay in the system which is hampering us to um, create jobs. The woman here in the front. Uh, I've used Iceland shopping for quite a while and had deliveries. My sister lives in Shipley down in Yorkshire and, sh and the Yorkshire branch have stopped the free deliveries because of the extra fuel costs. Mm -hmm. Now, how f is that fair? I, I love this. So, this is, <laughs> this is uh, good for we, you. Good we, for you. Yeah, good this for you. is a political <laughs> program. I'll, 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 I'll speak to you afterwards. I will speak to you afterwards. To speak to afterwards. This woman. Um, we, we haven't cut any deliveries because of fuel costs. We've actually increased our deliveries five times, um, and actually, shoppers are now using it as opposed to driving themselves to yeah. shops to save on fuel. Yeah, it may be for other reasons, but I'll speak to you afterwards. There you go. You're going to get personal service from the manager <laughs> of Iceland. Come on. The man there in the pink shirt. Yeah, we've been talking about levelling up uh, um, for a little bit here. Um, but levelling up itself has only been kind of going for, what, the last maybe three, four years? Um, I the one thing that we, as, as politicians and governments, uh, and successive governments here, yeah, um, they don't seem to have a long-term strategy. That's why our roads were never great, because you can have a, a Labour government in them for eight years and, or ten years and a Conservative for another 10, 15 years, and everyone's got short-term promises Right, um, the, which doesn't help. For yeah, 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 of course. Yeah. Well, yeah. It doesn't help. It doesn't help uh, um, the uh, um, what? Well, what you were there, what are there to serve in the first place is have some long-term plans that benefit the whole country and not your party. Yeah, the, it's for the people, and I think leveling up. That was the idea. It was trying to level up the north and the south because it has been an issue for a long, long time. And do you, are you feeling that it's it's coming? In yes, the, it is. It's yes, of course it is. Yeah, uh, um, I think that uh, um, there's some in Newcastle. Uh, they're, uh, um, they're starting to uh, um, um, bring some city centre jobs in, government jobs. I think that uh, uh, the BBC and people like that actually have started to start, rather than be institutionalised in London of starting to push out into the wider economy, yeah? And I think that was the whole idea of the uh, uh, um, levelling up, is to take some of not just the private sector, but also the government and make them share out the distribution a bit better. Okay. We've only got about a minute left. Yeah, just, you know, the, the, I think the levelling up is important to talk about, but it's also important to put it in the context of the wider question of the British economy. And, you know, it's no one is going to turn the nose up at 65 million or whatever it was put in uh, different places and that's you know that's to be commended and more of that please but you have to look at the, the government's the broader picture I'm glad someone raised the question of a long-term plan because this economic crisis that we're currently living through has been long in the making and it's not going to go away at the end of this year it's not going to go away at the end of next year or five years unless the government commits to not just you know very laudably or whatever flinging bits of money here there and everywhere but having a general plan for increasing production and kick-starting the economy in some kind of fashion so if you look at something really central like housing which you know if you're going to level up a place it's not just about reopening boots or things like that it's also about are people going to want to stay living there because there's affordable housing there's decent housing there's enough of it the government's target is 300,000 houses a year Michael Gove brought in to be the new kind of house, quite brief, yeah, housing of guru but this is really important his big announcement on housing is, oh, no, sorry, we're not going to meet the target this year. Sorry about that. But we're having, we've got some shiny policy around referendums with homeowners. So, you know, on a fundamental level, the government cannot okay. get its head around the fact that having a long-term plan to do something radical with the economy. OK. I, and you're taking your breath, Matt, but I'm afraid we are out of time. I'm so sorry you had your hand up. Our hour is up. Thank you very much to the panel. Thank you very much to the audience for coming along and being so lively and engaging. And, madam, you will get your question answered about Iceland, which is absolutely fantastic. Uh, and, of course, thank you very much to you at home for watching. From Question Time in Newcastle. Bye-bye.